All right. Well, welcome everyone to tonight's basic. It's the last in this series on the visual gospel. And tonight we're going to be talking about um, sacred art today. Question mark. <laughs> Is it possible for us to have sacred art today? And we're going to kind of look at uh, why we have even a question mark there. <laughs> Um, what kind of is our current situation when it comes uh, to sacred art in the church? So uh, before we begin, we're going to begin with our prayer. Instead of Lexia Divina, we're going to use our prayer before study. So in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, together we pray. Incomprehensible creator, the true fountain of light and only author of all knowledge, day we beseech thee to enlighten our understanding and to remove from us all darkness of sin and ignorance. Thou who makest eloquent the tongues of those who lack utterance, direct our tongues and pour on our lips the grace of thy blessing. Give us a diligent and obedient spirit, quickness of apprehension, capacity of retaining, and the powerful assistance of thy holy grace, that what we hear or learn we may apply to thy honor and the eternal salvation of all the souls. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So, um, kind of an outline. I just realized that the last bullet point I don't really cover. So, <laughs> I don't get it. So, we will talk about sacred art today. One thing that uh, was part of a previous, or originally part of one of the previous um, presentations on, on, uh, the theology of, of church architecture that we didn't get to was kind of the modern period of architecture. And so we'll actually we'll look at that tonight uh, instead since we didn't get to it. So that will be included on our outline. Um, and we're going to look at certain resources, certain practical things that we do. How can we experience sacred art today? And part of that will include places that we can go to uh, because, you know, it's one thing being able to just look at, images here on the projector, and a whole other thing to actually visit the sacred space uh, itself. Uh, it's a much more profound experience when we actually are in the space for which it's made. Uh, not that the Steinhausen Center, you know, is a bad space. It's just not really a sacred space. <laughs> All right, so a little bit of review. The, very, the, very, the immediate last session that we did last month was on saints and symbols. So we looked at um, some especially early Christian symbols that have been carried out through this carried through the centuries um, as well as how do we recognize uh, certain saints by a lot of you know symbols maybe of their martyrdom or specific things having to do with their life uh, prior to that uh, we talked about architecture uh, especially classical principles of architecture that were used to show forth biblical truths um, through the architecture of churches and chapels. And then we also, we spent a time too talking about beauty. There's subjective and objective aspects to it. Um, we talked about the proper use of abstraction. So I'm just gonna, we're gonna review a little bit of that because it's gonna help us move into, you know, the kind of transition between this kind of classical approach to art and architecture uh, versus what happened through uh, the movement of modernism. Uh, so, if we remember, so there's, as a Catholic, we want to balance the subjective and objective aspects. So subjective has to do with the subject. So there's two subjects when it comes to art. You've got the artist and the viewer. And so the artist and the, and the person looking at the art, there's, there's going to be this communication that's going on. And so even though the artist is going to be revealing something of their own personality through the art, they also, if it's going to be sacred art, they need to be contemplating the divine mysteries and so art is really going to come out of their sacred art is going to come out of prayer and and because it comes out of prayer it should also lead the viewer back to prayer um, help us to encounter uh, God um, so and John Paul II said the most important part especially for the artist and the viewer is that they themselves are the work of art that God is doing within them so they should grow in grace uh, through this. Uh, so even the subjective aspect, which has to do with the person and how they see the, and how they interact with the artwork, um, there's going to be an objective aspect to it. 
because it should lead us objectively closer to God if it's going to be sacred art. Um, so there is a subjective aspect, but it's not totally devoid from the objective aspect. Then Thomas Aquinas, he is the one who formulated kind of best the characteristics of uh, the objective characteristics of beauty. Well, what is in the thing itself that makes it beautiful? And so we talked about the categories of, of integrity. There's a wholeness. It's not lacking anything. Harmony, the relationships between different parts work together. Uh, clarity or radiance of form that it actually shows forth, shows forth what the thing is in of itself. And then unity and variety. So it may have varieties of elements, but they work together in a comprehensive whole. So a thing becomes beautiful when it's, to use philosophical terms, ontological reality, or its being, or what it is, uh, reveals the truth about itself. Um, so, you know, a, a pencil is very beautiful if it looks like a pencil and you can tell what it is, but if you saw something that looks like a pencil and they're like, no, actually... You know, it's a um, it's a water cooler. Well, it's not a very beautiful water cooler because it doesn't look like one. It doesn't have any radiance of form. <laughs> um, so uh, we also talked about abstraction, and uh, we we you know sometimes we think of abstract art. You know, we we might say, well, usually what's being thought of for us in our terms is fragmentary abstraction. So. Um, where there was, especially in the modern time period, there was kind of uh, a trying to create art that had nothing to do with any reference to nature or, or the real world. In a sense, it formed this disconnect between, between reason and faith, and it, and it basically became purely subjective at times. Uh, the other extreme was super-realism, which basically only shows external things. Um, and so it shows our fallen condition, but it doesn't show the hope of salvation. And the, the true Catholic form of abstraction that you, we saw in the different forms of art, that, for example, the, the, the three main forms that we looked at during one of our sessions was uh, iconographic, Gothic, and Baroque, is that you have a certain amount of abstraction, but the abstraction is there to show forth the reality of things. So here you can see some examples. This is a Picasso piece. Um, it's very fragmentary. In fact, his whole thinking during this time, the way, reason why he changed a different form of painting is because he basically saw the world as having no meaning. And so he wanted, and so basically, the world has no meaning, my painting shouldn't. <laughs> um, so it's very depression, hopelessness is involved with it. So uh, then you have super realism. This is a church in, in, in Rome. But the, the issue is, is that when you're looking at the ceiling of it, you just see straight to the outside. You see the same thing inside the church as you would see outside. And so there's no difference between you should see redeemed creation inside of the church, not simply the same old fallen creation. Um, and so that's what, that's what holistic abstraction does is it abstracts from just purely what people look like. And so these are abstracted people on, the, on a door jam of the Shark Cathedral, and so they're elongated. Um, because remember, Gothic is about our pathway to heaven, and so you have these tall churches, and so um, you can still, of course, it's not so abstracted that you can't tell the people. <laughs> that would be fragmentary, but they're just abstracted enough. So there is an amount of abstraction that we should use uh, in uh, artwork as as Catholics. <laughs> um, but then we move into modernist architecture. So we had classical principles. Well. We'll look at those in a moment. So, uh, because modern arch modernist architecture kind of has um, a hold on most architecture that's done today, um, there's certain myths about contemporary church architecture that are kind of out there. And one of your handouts I have, it's an article written by an architect, Duncan Stroik, and uh, he goes through and he debunk some of these myths. And so we're going we're gonna to look at some of these myths as well. But you can, I gave you the full text because what he has is, is, is pretty good to have handy. Um, so here are some of his myths. We're going to look at uh, these first few. So the Second Vatican Council requires us to reject traditional church architecture and design new churches in a modernist style. So some people think we have, to, we have to build churches this way because Vatican II says so. Well, that's a myth. That's not true. Uh, new churches must be designed in accordance with a document Environment and Art and Catholic Worship, which you may have never heard of. 
but um, which was a document that came out in 1978. And actually, that's not true either. It's really not even it's not church law. That, we'll, but we'll talk about that document more. Uh, the fan shape is the most appropriate for expressing participation at church. That's some, another myth. Uh, the church building should be designed with noble simplicity, which means you shouldn't have images of saints and other devotional items in the church. That's another myth that sometimes shows up. Um, the, the Catholic Church should be building the most avant-garde architecture of its day. So in other words, we gotta be we got to keep with the times because that's the thing we've done throughout history. We've always been with the times. Well, that's another myth about the Catholic Church. So we'll, we'll be looking at some of these, addressing some of these by what we're going to discuss. In the past, people saw church building as the Domus Dei, or the house of God, but today our theology says that it's the Domus Ecclesia, the house of the people of God. So therefore, our church architecture should be focused on us, not on God. That's another myth. <laughs> or, and then uh, his tenth one is, uh, since God dwells everywhere, he's just as present in the parking lot as in the church. So therefore, we shouldn't even talk about sacred places at all. Another myth. Um, but these myths, all these myths, really play into the principles of modernism that were play, that were uh, formed in that movement, and we'll we'll look exactly what the what what those are all about here in a moment. So we had talked in the presentation on on uh, on sacred architecture, the theology of of church architecture. We had first talked about different princi biblical principles that are that are put in place that are described through the actual physical makeup of the building. And the way that they do that is they actually apply classical principles that were actually a part of uh, Greek and Roman um, uh, architecture even before that. But so a lot of things like, uh, so classical principles is not a specific style, but it's principles that are applied to many different styles across the centuries. So Carolingian and Romanesque and Gothic and Baroque and Neoclassicism, all of those use classical principles but apply them in a variety of different ways. They're all very unique. Uh, but so some of those principles are that you want to imitate nature through your architecture. Uh, you want to imitate the, 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 uh, the mathematical underpinnings that God has put into nature. In a sense, you know, our creative act is to be modeled after God's creativity. Um, so you want to have a, a harmony in what you create because, especially for sacred places, you're trying to reorder a creation that has become disordered. Uh, and in that way, again, you're, we're imitating God's mind. And uh, you should show the logic of the structure of the building, but you want to make it look effortless. And so you might go to this you know, huge cathedral, and you can wonder, well, how in the world did they make this? You know, it looks like it's just, it's just effortless. The ceiling is just floating there. You know, and how did how could that be? Because they hide you know, maybe some of the structural parts. Um, but it's also and it's also respectful of of tradition. It's trying to uphold what the church has always taught uh, through the centuries. And and uh, this this image here, this is a uh, the, the Vitruvian Man. We're probably more familiar with the Leonardo da Vinci version of the Vitruvian Man. Um, but so the man has certain uh, so. Certain proportions between, like that length of the hand, the length of the foot, the, the height, their arms. There's certain harmonic proportions that are in the man, and those were taken and used in building, uh, uh, not just churches, but any kind of building, and even like furniture and stuff like that. People had used those kind of principles. But then comes uh, modernist architecture, and this really begins in the early early 20th century um, with the Bauhaus movement in Europe, and uh, so you, there you got 1920s. And uh, it didn't really begin influencing church architecture here in the United States until the 1940s. And I'll, we'll see in a little bit how that happened. Um, but you have certain principles that kind of form an underpinning of modernist architecture. So in these six boxes here, these are some, you know, summarize some basic principles of modernist architecture. So um, the ones on the, on, uh, this, the first column, they kind of go together. So they're, they're easiest explained kind of as a unit. So first one is functionalism. So architecture is going to be more focused on the function of the building rather than any kind of, you know, the building is, is simply there because we need a space to do stuff. And that's why we have a building. There's really no merit in the building of itself. It's just we need a space to do something and so we're going to make a space that can 
we can do stuff in. <laughs> it's purely functional. Um, though the ironic thing is, is when you're, it's that many times those buildings really become not very functional <laughs> for what actually is supposed to go on there. Um, uh, express structure. So in, in classical terms, you want to make things look effortless. And so they might, you might hide some of the things. Well, in, in, uh, in modernist architecture, they really hate that. They see that as, well, you're not being transparent. You're not being honest about the way. And so you have to see all of the structure of the building. And you've got to see all of the beams. And you've got to see the concrete. And you've got to see the actual material that's holding the building up. Because if you don't, then you're being dishonest about your architecture. Um, also, like for example, for churches, um, what goes on inside, that function inside, needs to be shown outside the building. And so we'll see in churches what the, what's going to happen is that on the exterior of the building, they're going to the the most uh, um, the greatest focus on the exterior of the building is going to be at that place where the most important things inside the building are happening. So, for example where the altar is and where the Eucharist is being celebrated in the church, inside the church, on the outside of the church, right at that spot is where it's going to be most emphasized exteriorly. Same thing with the baptismal font. So during this period, Eucharist and baptism were seen. These are the most important things that are happening in the church. So therefore, the exterior of the building is going to show exactly the place where they're happening. Uh, skin for the liturgy. So this is another, you know, it's almost a... Uh, a rejection, really, of of architecture itself. Um, this is just simply a place for doing the liturgy in it. So it really doesn't matter what it looks like. Um, and they will. And, they, and I'm not just saying this to make fun of it. They actually these are explicitly things that they say. These are their principles. Um, so on the other side, spirit of the age. So as classical uh, principles were desiring to uphold tradition. Uh, in the modernist movement, it was all about we got to come up with something new. So we want to throw off and really, in a sense, start from something, start purely from scratch. Um, I was hoping that was my sister. But, so if my sister were here, she would definitely tell you that that was, is very much the thing when it comes to modern art and architecture is that if you, your art is worthless unless you can innovate something that nobody else has ever done before. And that's, that becomes the highest principle is that kind of innovation. Um, then there's a minimalism. So that's where, you know, if you've seen churches that have been whitewashed, um, that comes from this modernist principle of minimalism. Let's show as little as possible. We don't want to, uh, um, let's remove all of, the, all of the extraneous ornamentation, the extraneous images. Um, and also, as part of this, too, there was also this a priori or, or or really without any kind of prior reason, um, this ideal of participation was a church in a round shape. Um, but they really have no, there's really no theological basis for that other than they just decide that we're going to do it to look like a theater. Um, so anyway, so this kind, these kind of modernist ideas are going to really um, really influence a lot of architecture. Just to give you kind of a, an, in, uh, uh, an insight into it, so um, here's a guy, I think he's German, Miles van der Rohe. <laughs> he's a, he was a, an architect during this time. He said, the will of the age conceived in spatial terms. That's what modernist architecture is all about. The will of the age conceived in spatial terms. And then Le, Corbus Le Corbusier, a French architect and atheist, he said, our own epic is determining day by day its own style. So it's all about this kind of self-determination, something new. Um, of course, when churches began being built, you have, here's a reaction from a German writer. He's standing before Antwerp Cathedral, and he says, you know, the men who built these had dogmas, but today we only have opinions. And with opinions, one does not build cathedrals. If you have a, if you if if there isn't anything found lasting and true that we can build off of, we're not going to build something like this. And in fact, you're going to build opinion churches. And so we got a, some pictures of some opinion churches here. So so they're in the United States and in Europe during various periods of time during this modern period. So some of them get very interesting looking. 
Um, there's some opinion churches. Here's some more opinion churches. <clears throat> I just know what to say, but <laughs> more opinion churches. When you find some of these, you can find some comments where they, they like, you know, Jenga Block Church. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that that really is a church in India. That's, that's a church. Yeah. It's a Catholic church, yeah. Yes. It is the chapel, the chapel of I think yeah, it's a boat with an airplane. On it. See, that's what when you when you have this. So the, the, this is this is a very famous church. This one that looks kind of like a mushroom. Um, this was built by Le, Corbe, Le Corbusier. That I he famously said he's he's an atheist, and so he's building Catholic churches. Um, he famously said that a house is a machine for living in. So, you know, giving that view of, of uh, architecture, you could probably call a church that's a machine for worshiping in. So, so you can see, the, you know, the founding, fa the founding principles of modern architecture are really kind of, you know, at, they, they don't fit with our pr Catholic principles. Um, so where did, how did this get to the United States? So here's another. This is a uh, church in, uh, in Germany. Um, so you can see this is a very uh, stark image of the the minimalism. You know, so I, 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 I maybe those are stations of the cross. Maybe I, I'm not really sure what those are, but <laughs> you can tell that this one was built. This was built in 1930, so this is before the Second Vatican Council. So modernist architecture really doesn't have anything to do with the Second Vatican Council. We'll see that in a moment. So because you can see here in the back, it actually has a high altar on on the back there, but it's a church made in the the modernist style. So you got modernist architecture has its origins in the 1920s in Europe, and then uh, you have the World Wars happen, uh, which causes a displacement of the architects. And so they actually leave Europe, uh, those modern architects of this movement, uh, leave Europe and come to the United States for refuge. And they're not only welcomed, but they're given prominent positions in architecture schools in the United States. Um, and then so, so that's when you begin to see all these modernist churches building up because now you have all these ideas that have come to the United States and they're new and they're fresh and they're popular even though they're, I mean, they're you know, 20 years old by now. But, uh, and then Vatican II happens in 65. And then, uh, um, so those who are proponents of the modernist movement, they will use, they will pick principles from the Second Vatican Council to support their use of this modernist architecture because they're already doing it. So, it, I mean, they've already been building modern-looking churches prior to the Second Vatican Council, but then they use the principle of the Second Vatican Council to basically say, see, this is why we have to build them this way. And then there was a little document called Environment and Art and Catholic Worship in 1978, which we'll talk about here next, is actually kind of a, uh, it's almost an encoding of modernist ideas into the way Catholics will build churches. And then, uh, so then you've got churches based on that document being built. So we should look at that document. All right. So, environment and art and Catholic worship, and I actually have a copy of it over there if you want to check it out. Um, so it was, it was uh, produced by the U.S. Bishops Committee on the Liturgy, um, it was never voted on by the bishop. So it really, you know, when it was first put out in 1978, it was pretty much taken as law. So this is the way the church says churches need to be done. Welcome. I just made it to the fun part. We're just starting our environment in Catholic worship. <laughs> so the document was taken as law, but then it was it was finally clarified in 1999 that really this document was not never law. It was never intended to be law. It wasn't a statement of the whole bishops, and so you don't have to follow it. In fact, we'll talk about later is that by now it's actually been superseded by another document, which is a little bit better. 
<laughs> we'll talk about that. So it's about 50 pages long. It's really kind of like a little booklet. It does have photos within it. Um, so, for example, here's a photo of a church. You know, so these are photos, obviously, of churches that have already been put together. So they really are churches prior to the Second Vatican Council. Um, well, I guess by the time it's 78, you know, they could have been built afterwards too. But all right, so what we're going to do is we're going to look and see how this document really codifies those modernist principles of that of that uh, architecture. So. Um, the three of those uh, uh, principles were the functionalism, the express structure, and the skin for the liturgy. So you see in the document it says, the building or cover enclosing the architectural space, so we don't call it a church or anything, um, is a shelter or a skin for a liturgical action. It does not have to look like anything else, past or present. So this is a founding principle for how Catholics are going to build churches that it's a skin that doesn't need to look like anything in particular. Um, in fact, the entire document says very little about actual architecture. <laughs> it's, a, it's about art and environment, but about architecture itself, it says almost nothing. It's almost like a, uh, I don't know, maybe a fear of architecture that kind of comes through it. So, uh, but when you, so, so you're, they built, you're, when you're designing a building from the inside out, the, the exterior then becomes the last thing on your mind. Um, and so what it ends up looking like really doesn't make that big of a difference. Um, so this is, I mean, this is almost, you know, verbatim modernist thought um, in this document. All right, so then uh, minimalism uh, being brought in. Here. So you've got several places in which the call is to reduce symbols, use fewer symbols. Don't overdo it. Um, so it says, rejection of certain embellishments which have in the course of history become hindrances. In many areas of religious practice, this means a simplifying or refocusing on primary symbols, more austere interiors with fewer objects on the walls and in the corners. So it's, it's, you, know, you can definitely see it's calling for a minimalist idea of it. Um, in fact, the thought was, we need to make the space, the church space, look incomplete. So the environment is appropriate when it clearly invites and needs an assembly of people to complete it. So when people are not there, it should look like it's incomplete. Um, so in a sense, a lack of beauty. It shouldn't be beautiful when people are not there. All right. So to give a kind of example of that, this is one that comes from the document. This is an example of a, a renovation um, in the picture. So this is uh, see St. Mark's in Minnesota, and it was built in 1862. So if we look over here, then um, or on the left side we have what it looked like originally. So you can see a lot of ornamentation. You can see you know, um, behind the altar, the, uh, the fancy side altars going on there. So, but then when they renovate it, and so this was the document's example of a good renovation, uh, as uh, you can tell on the other side, now they've whitewashed the ceiling uh, and of all the ornamentation. It's all gone. No more ornamentation. The side altars are gone as well. So they still have the backs of the altars, but there's no altar there anymore. They remove that part. Um, this and uh, the the craziest thing in my mind is the what they did in the sanctuary is is that now the so it used to be you know you've got the altar in the center and you know you got the anvil and the, the presider's chairs off to the sides. Well what they did in this one is now you have the ambo on one side, the altar on the other side, and smack dab in the middle you have the presider's chair with the giant I mean they kept the beautiful ornate altar piece, but now it has become a throne for the priest. And I'm like I would feel really self-conscious celebrating mass there if I had to like sit there in the middle with this huge, you know, fancy altarpiece. It's almost like, well, that speaks to me that the priest is much more important than Christ's presence on the altar. So, I don't know. So, so, but this is an example in this document as to this is what how we ought to renovate our churches. Um. So then we look at the, so how does it incorporate the spirit of the age? 
So there's a there's a, a great emphasis over you know showing forth our uh, our individual our local ideas our local cultural aspects over any kind of universal or traditional aspects of the faith. Um, also, uh, uh, yeah. So so a church really should be a con the congregation's self image. So in other words, instead of building a church theologically, you should build it anthropolog anthropologically. It should be not in the image of God. It should be in the image of man. Um, so, we, well, it says contemporary art is our own, the works of artists of our time and place, and belongs in our celebrations as surely as we do. Well, I'm like, so were the other generations, right? But the thing is, is like, is what are the principles of beauty that it's trying to show? Um, it's not so much the period of time in which something's created, but as is it speaking truth about what's being what's being celebrated there? Um, many local ch churches must use spaces designed and built in the former period, spaces which may now be unsuitable for the liturgy. Um, so definitely, you can see this emphasis on the spirit of our age at this time is superior to any other time that's come before us. Um, so there's and Another interesting thing is, 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 is that the space needs to incorporate a certain flexibility in it, an ability to move things around, which seems really odd for me. So even the essential furnishings. So a movable altar and ambo, those should be able to be moved around. A movable organ. I'm like, why would you ever need to move an organ? But it's what it recommends. You should move an organ around. Um, movable cross. So, so things should be able to... Instead of uh, instead of having permanent things fixed um, to show kind of this uh, you know the timelessness of God, it's instead emphasized the changingness of the world. So another example of the spirit of age, because the spirit of the age always changes. Therefore, our church should always change to match the spirit of the age. Um, the church in the round idea. So this really it connects with ideas of hospitality. Um, so there's an idea that it, the church is more hospitable if it's in a round shape. Um, maybe that's true. I don't know. Uh, but then they they really focus on it really focus on eye contact. So it needs to be a, they, they had the round shape so you can make eye contact with each other. So a space and its seating should be so designed that one can see the places of the ritual action. But further, these spaces cannot be so distant that eye contact is impossible. For eye contact is important in any act of ministry. Not only are the ministers to be visible to all present, but among themselves the faithful should be able to have visual contact being attentive to one another as they celebrate the liturgy. I don't know. I am, it sounds really strange to me. I'm like, do you find making eye contact across the church and other people while we celebrate the liturgy is helpful in participating in the liturgy? Uh, but that was the that was the idea and the thought. It seems more of a distraction than anything. Yeah. Yeah. So some other limitations of this document um, doesn't have scriptural references. I th it has one scriptural reference, like right at the beginning, it has nothing to do with the, uh, with uh, architecture or anything. Um, but otherwise, it's completely devoid of scripture other than that one reference, which I find very troubling. Uh, also, there's absolutely no historical reference. It almost assumes that there's no there have been no churches built prior to the modern time period, uh, which when we talked about the theology of church architecture, we see there's an incredible wealth of tradition of how churches are built to be able to show forth those biblical truths. Um, the complete focus on the Domus Ecclesia, so the church as the house of the people of God, which is a true thing, but it's more than just simply that. It's also the house of God and a number of other theological uh, analogies that can be used. Also, the, the fo main focus is on liturgical action more than architecture and art. It's really kind of interesting. In a document that's on environment and art, it says pro probably just as much, if not more, about how the liturgy should be celebrated, which in my mind seems really odd because we already have a document, that the official document from the church that tells us how the church is to be celebrated. It's called the Roman Missal and the general instruction of the Roman Missal. The germ. So those are the. I mean, so it's like the focus that the document really has is really unneeded because we have those other documents already. And so through all these, there's really a loss of transcendence because there's a focus on 
on us and, and really kind of a, a self turning inwardly. All right, so this is this is kind of this document. So this was produced in 78. And now the next thing I go into, just a little disclaimer. I'm not going into this because I want to stir up controversy or I think that the people who are involved in it were bad people at all. But it's it's a needed example. It helps it's going to help us understand uh, certain things because churches at that were built right after this time, right after 1978, used this document to build their churches. And so we can see that these churches were built based upon these principles. And so I'm not saying that the people who built them were bad to follow this document. This was the document, and that's what they ought to have done, was follow the document that they thought was law from the bishops. So they did the correct and proper thing to do. But it still doesn't change the fact that the principles within the document are flawed, and they don't really fit in with Catholic principles of, of, uh, of architecture. It really doesn't show forth the theology of architecture. So that being said, a church that was built just after this was St. Colin Pillar. So, um, in fact, it says in, in uh, uh, and what I actually did is I, I there's a, we have a box of material that the committee that worked on the church um, that we still have in the parish. So I went through and I read through a lot of their a lot of the documents and, and found some of the things that they said. So they said explicitly that the document art and environment in Catholic worship was the basis for much of their decision making, which it should have been because it had just come out from the USCCB. And so, I mean, there was nothing else really for them to follow other than that. So they did right in doing that. So here's the original design. You may have seen this uh, posted up. I think it's posted on the social level. I think so. Um, uh, but I also put this. So there, there's the there's the a photo from the uh, document art environment Catholic worship of a church in Minnesota. And I don't know. I seem to see a little bit of resemblance between the two as to how they were built. Um, so anyway, so what we're going to see is we're going to see how our church at St. Columkill does incorporate the principles from art, environment, Catholic worship, which means it incorporates modernist architecture principles. So, But once again, I'm not saying this because I think that the people who did it and those who were involved in the process of building the church were bad. Um, but we have to admit just exactly what it is, right? So... If we look at so the, some of the, the, the modernist principles, functionalism, express structures, a skin for the liturgy. So if we look, um, that's what our church does. At St. Columkill, it does take the places of the Eucharist and baptism and expresses those places in its external structure. So that's why we have you know, these, the, you know, the, the triangular uh, skylights. One is above the altar. The other is above the baptismal font because it's either using the princip modernist principle that the exterior of the building needs to show the exact places inside the building where those important things happen, which is, I mean, that's a principle that was, I'm not sure where they got that, why, you know, through modern, because it really isn't involved in any of the, the classical principles of building churches. Um, also, the structure needs to, and the materials that need to be used need to be shown. So that's why in our church, you know, our pillars, you can see the concrete that they're made out of. You know, they're not covered up in any way. You see the concrete there. Also, the wooden beams, you see the brick, which is the actual material that's holding the church up. Um, and so, and, 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 uh, they're, and that's what you see in the, uh, the guidelines for the, the parish, for our environment, that this building demonstrates integrity for the brick that is seen as the foundational material of the building. Yeah. I can say one thing. Yeah. In Vienna, uh, Virginia, there's a church where the inside looks exactly like ours. Oh, ours really? Uh -huh. Except for one thing, where we have wooden beams, they have steel beams, and they've painted, they painted those blue. Oh. <laughs> and wood is much better. I, yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would probably tend to agree. I'm glad we don't have blue metal beams. <laughs> so... So and so and overall, remember the document says it really doesn't need to look like anything past or present. It doesn't need to look like a church. So when you look at St. Columbia, I mean, we're used to seeing it, so we know it's a church, right? Now, 
well, we have had people who have come and they're not really sure how to enter and where to go to when they get here because, you know, it doesn't, I mean, it's not a traditional looking kind of church. And in fact, you know, so if most of those classically formed churches, you know, through the centuries, whether, whether it be, you know, um, Baroque or Gothic or, or Carolingian and all those kind of things, they look like churches. And so people wouldn't really build other kinds of buildings to look like them, right? Because they very clearly, they have a radiance of form. They say church. Whereas in the modern period, since they don't need to look like anything, they don't have that same kind of clarity of form that says this style means church. So what you do find is that, you know, someone could come up to St. Conco and say, hey, you know, I really kind of like that architectural style. I'm going to use that to build my building, which, which may not be a church. And so perhaps that building might be something like a uh, – uh, the Sarpy County Juvenile Justice Center. <laughs> so, not to make fun of our church at all, you know, because our, I mean, ours came first, you know. But that's the thing is that they saw. I'm, i I don't know for sure, but I mean, it seems pretty obvious in my mind that they, you know, saw our church and they're like, hey, we kind of like that. Let's kind of incorporate some of those elements in ours, you know. But if you have like a, a church that's based on classical principles. Most people aren't going to say, hey, let's make our building look like that church. So, so that can, that's kind of what happened when, you know, the building of the church is not really needing to look like anything. Uh, all right, so another principle is minimalism. So, you know, in our church, we do have relatively few images. Um, and so I'm, and you've got to think back to, you know, ours has been renovated. We'll talk about that in a moment. But think back to before it was renovated. Um, but really, we only had three sculptures in the church. We had one of the Sacred Heart, one of Mary, one of the Resurrection. Um, there was no stained glass because in the, the committee, as they were going through, they said that the large windows from the old church were of dubious value. So that's why they weren't included. And fortunately, um, one of our parishioners were, was able to save it, and they were put in storage. And they, so we had them to be able to use when we did the renovation. Um, also, the Stations of the Cross that we currently have up, the, orig the original thought was not to have them up, but the original thought was to simply the wooden crosses that are underneath them, those were going to just be the stations of the cross. So you can see there's you know another example of minimalism. Here we have those, I mean, so glad that it ended up that we've you know kept those because they are very beautiful stations of the cross. But you can see the idea of minimalism that comes through that document, comes through modernist ideas, was to, well, we need to get rid of all the images. Um, also, there's there's very little decoration or ornamentation. So, like you know, some of those classically formed churches, you know, you see, you know, they might have like, you know, you know, almost like you know, f leaves or flowers or or you know, uh, different geometric patterns or things like that. Well, we at St. Columkill really didn't have much of that at all. So there was you know another kind of minimalism in there. Um, also, remember the idea of the church looking incomplete when it's empty, um, was also, without the people present, the space is lacking an essential element, Christ visible and his people. So there's something lacking, supposed to be something lacking in our church when it's empty. So there's a kind of, you know, churches aren't supposed to be beautiful in of themselves, but the beauty comes from being filled by people. Which, I mean, yeah, we have our own, I mean, there's a beauty that comes from us as well, but the space too, if it's being built on, with a theology of architecture, also has to be show forth uh, a beauty in of itself. All right, the idea of, of church in the round. So I mean, ours is a church in the round. Um, so no seat is more than fifty feet from the altar. Um, so very much the idea of hospitality and eye contact. So the pure arrangement and warm colors of dusty rose and earth tones promote hospitality. Um, I'm not really sure. I mean, I have to. I mean, I suppose I can. I don't know if that makes it more hospitable for, for me or not. But um, at worship, we see one another, and mentally we recall the events we have shared. Um, so you can see that was, I mean, it's very much a principle that comes from the document. Um, also, the, the nave and the sanctuary, I didn't, didn't mention this earlier, but in art and environment, pretty much makes no distinction between the nave and the sanctuary. So the nave, the place where we sit, and the sanctuary, the area where the altar is. Um, throughout tradition, that was always, remember, it stems all the way back from the tent and the temple. The distinction between the holy place and the holy of holies carried all the way through. But then during the modernist time period, they basically wanted to remove that. Um, 
so that the seating is des designated to draw us together toward the altar. The entire worship area is sacred space. So there's really no distinction between the two, and, and the flooring, you know, was all the same. Um, to emphasize the fact that there there is no distinction uh, between there is there is no longer a holy place versus the holy of holies. Uh, yeah. Notice where the priest chair is. Yes, it's the priest chair at the center. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that some of the you know some of the ideas with the Second Vatican Council and some of the changes for the mass that happened was we want to reduce clericalism. Well. I think some of the changes, especially like making the throne of the priest be at the center of attention, I don't know, it makes me feel self-conscious when that's occurring. I'd much rather be off to the side because I don't want to be the center of attention. Um, so, uh, so, but, uh, so, so for these reasons, because our church was kind of built using these modernist principles that really don't jive with the theology of church architecture, is why we've had to change some of them and why we did a renovation um, to really raise the level of sacredness of the space. So pre our renovation, we had no stained glass. You know, we had the light boxes with the stained glass uh, in them, which was an, an addition. Um, but now we've, we've included the stained glass and the clear story um, in the windows above um, uh, the altar. <laughs> um, also, prior to, I mentioned the flooring and the nave and the sanctuary were exactly the same because there's no distinction between the two. But now we have this clear distinction um, using the flooring. We have separate colors to indicate the sanctuary is sanctuary. It's holy. It's a whole, the holy place where the, uh, uh, where the altar is. Also, prior to, we had that kind of the spirit of the times where you could just move everything around. Um, so we had a movable altar in Ambo. Um, but of course, church in some of these things we had to change because church law, you know, universal law in the church said, okay, you know, some of these principles are not good. And so we have to, you, you need to have a permanent altar and amble because they represent Christ himself, who is the rock who does not change. Um, uh, also there was no main crucifix, uh, in the sanctuary. Um, so now we have a main crucifix. As well as, you know, before people would come in, if they weren't from here, they wouldn't really know, you know, where do I genuflect to? Where's the tabernacle at? Um, but now it's very clear you can see where the tabernacle is uh, you know, towards the front of the church. So, you know, a lot of the this, this renovation that we did um, a few years ago was needed uh, because our church was built using this document, which is what they should have done at the time because that was what they had. Um, but it had the principles that really don't fit with our Catholic theology. So the question then, because some people will ask, you know, okay, so am I all about the old stuff and I just, I just hate new stuff? <laughs> well, that's really, that's really not the, uh, the issue here. It's not whether something's new or old, um, because, you know, I, uh, it's not about referring the old to the new or living out of a nostalgia. Oh, you know, I remember back in the days, you know, when we had this. You know, I don't really have any nostalgia of that. I don't have any nostalgia of modern architecture either. So, <laughs> because I mean, I, I haven't lived long enough for that. But <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I, and I'm. It's not so much wishing to experience, you know, all those wonderful days in the past of you know Gothic architecture or something. Um, but no, the, the importance is what is true? What is built upon principles that are true? Are the modernist principles true? Or are, those the, are the biblical principles shown through the classical um, elements uh, true? So, so when we talk to people, that's a lot of text, sorry. Um, so rather than automatically moving to traditional models of art simply because they're traditional, we need to understand the, the, the truths behind it, the theology. And that's why we spent a whole time, two sessions ago, on the theology of the architecture and understanding the reasons why. That the liturgy is about giving glory to God and his work in sanctifying us. And we should only reject modern or contemporary uh, art and architecture, not because it's simply the art of now, but we should question it when it is based upon truths that are foreign to our faith. That's when we need to question it. Um, so forms of art that are ignorant of theology, you know, 
they're going to reveal something opposite than the faith if, if they're ignorant of what they ought to be revealing. Um, so we should critique those and question if they're really suitable for use in our churches. Um, because may, if those principles are not, are not Catholic principles, they really aren't suited for our churches. Um, in 2000, um, Art and Environment and Catholic Worship was superseded by this document from the USCCB, Built of Living Stones. And uh, um, so it's improved in some ways. So this document, and I've got a copy of it over there if you want to look at it too. Um, it has more scriptural references, which is wonderful. So it actually does build, draw in some of those scriptural elements that we went through in the theology of architecture section. Um, it also includes many requirements of liturgical law, but once again, it's not meant to be liturgical law. So if you so elements in there, if it's explicitly citing liturgical our liturgical law, we have to follow it. But there's also a lot of opinions <laughs> and, uh, that are in there. Um, so it it doesn't have illustrations or pictures that are slanted toward modernist ideas like art and environment does. Um, and it does make finally make the distinction between the nave and the sanctuary. <laughs> Uh, but it also has limitations. In, in a sense, certain elements of, of those modernist ideas are, are retained in that document. So the kind of ritual functionalism, so that uh, an emphasis on what we do in the church over, over uh, what it actually looks like. So a kind of almost a kind of fear of architecture, um, even though it's supposed to be about architecture. Um, it doesn't have any illustrations. There are n so it doesn't, have, it doesn't have the modernist illustrations but it just doesn't have any about churches. And, and uh, so this, this line here is from uh, uh, Duncan Strike, who is a Catholic architect. He says, a document on architecture without citations of buildings is like a theology text which doesn't quote the Bible. You know, if you're going to talk about architecture, you really kind of need to see it. I mean, it would kind of be like me doing this, you know, the whole series of presentation on the visual gospel and without any pictures. <laughs> it would kind of really be dull and boring, and you really wouldn't learn a whole lot because you wouldn't know what the heck I'm talking about. <laughs> um, and really, the really external architectural design is almost totally ignored. It talks about the inside more than it talks about the outside, because the outside really doesn't matter. So there's still some limitations. And so even though it's an improvement, it's not the greatest document either. I've been going on really long. <laughs> Let's take a break. Um, and we'll go through, we'll, we'll look at some of the next uh, uh, three other myths of contemporary church architecture. As we move back, I forgot to mention the, uh, on the table, well, I think I mentioned it earlier. On the table over there, we have some resources, and I'll talk about it in the second uh, half, some of the resources we have over there, some of those books that you can take a look at. So if you want to come and take a seat, we're going to start up again. And uh, bef before we start again, I just want to, to, to clarify again, in talking about modern churches and saying that, you know, they really, they don't really, uh, since they're not built based upon Catholic principles and they don't show as clear the truth about what goes on, I'm not saying that people who worship in one are not truly having an experience of God. That is certainly the case. So they can certainly are the mass is the mass, even if the space really doesn't show forth the fullness of the heavenly vision that is happening. It's still truly they can still uh, be drawn into the reality of the mass, but in a sense it is more difficult. It does take more work when when some of those elements aren't there that in a sense automatically draw you in. Because if you've ever been, I mean, certain certain churches you can go into, you just you walk in the door and you're automatically drawn right in. You might not even have to walk in the door. <laughs> you just see it from the outside. It automatically lifts you up to a plane that's higher than yourself. Um, so I'm not saying that modernist churches, people who are inside of them are not experiencing God or the Mass is not happening. That is, of course, the case. Um, so let's look at the, the, some final three myths of contemporary church architecture. So well, is it impossible for us to build beautiful churches today? We'll look at that a little bit. Well, we can't afford to build beautiful churches today because we don't have the money that we had in the past. Uh, the money spent on churches is better spent on serving the less fortunate, feeding the hungry, educating the young. Maybe you've heard about that. You know, if only the Vatican would sell all of its you know artwork and then give that to the poor. You know? 
usually those are people that don't really realize how much the church actually gives to the poor already. Um, all right, so uh, in one of your handouts, I have a wonderful article that was written by uh, uh, Duncan Stroik, again, a uh, Catholic architect. Uh, and uh, it's entitled, How to Design a Church for the Poor. And he's got some, and it's, it's just beautifully written, so that's why I had to give you the whole thing. Because <laughs> uh, I don't have time to talk about the whole thing. But I wanted to give you a little bit of excerpt uh, from it. These two images, by the way, here are what the top one is Sacred Heart here in Omaha. And the bottom two, um, in case you haven't been there, those are St. Francis Cabrini, where Father Damien's headed to. Um, so, how to design a church for the poor. A little bit of what he says. A house for the poor should not be a modernist structure inspired by the machine. For the poor are surrounded and even enslaved by the machine and the technological. It is rather a building inspired by the human body, the new Adam, and the richness of his creation. For those whose lives may touch on angst and suffering, they do not need a contorted building exhibiting disharmony and atonality. Instead, they need an architecture of healing, which through proportions, materials, and spiritual light bring joy to the heart. A church which is welcoming to those in the state of poverty should not be a theater church where the visitor is forced to be on stage. Mm -hmm. What is the lack of church? That's St. Francis Cabrini. Yeah, Cabrini. That's where Father Damien's going to be a uh, pastor next. Um, so in both of those, both of those churches are, are closer to the downtown area where we have more of our poor. Um, so they need, so, so, you know, the, you know, when people bring up and say, well, we shouldn't build beautiful churches because you just should give it to the poor instead. Well, their assumption in saying that is the only thing the poor need are the physical needs. Well, the thing is they, they, they they miss the fact that as human persons, we're more than simply physical. Yes, we need to assist them through their phys through all the physical wants, but they have the same spiritual needs as we do. You know, is beauty and art simply for those who are rich, who are those who are the elite? No, it's for everyone. The poor, you know, they themselves cannot build a beautiful place. They do not have the abilities on their own. But when they come together, and Father Father Damien has you know talked about this, uh, you know, when he goes to, uh, you know, Guatemala on the mission trips, he talks about, you know, the poorest people will build the most beautiful of churches because when they pool all their resources together, they can do something greater than themselves. And, you know, it brings their dignity and worth back to them when they're able to do that. And so that's what a beautiful church can do for the poor and why it's absolutely, utterly essential to have beautiful churches so that, you know, for the poor and the rich alike, that we can be drawn out of the dreariness and ugliness of our world to experience the divine. Yeah. Um, shortly after I became Catholic, David took me to Sacred Heart. Yeah. So he made a mistake of taking me to the 1030 service. <laughs> At that time, I thought, there's only one way a Catholic Mass is. Uh -huh. Well, that Mass is not their ordinary Catholic Mass. It's like, I asked you, I nudged him, I said, am I going to get a Baptist church? Are you sure? Are you sure? <laughs> yeah. And I, and I meet with a girl on uh, Wednesday nights that goes there, and she won't go to any other service except for the 1030 right now. She says it's boring because it's not her regular, you know, whatever it is. But yeah. that is the most beautiful church, and they spent lots of money. And the floor to there, renovate it, yeah. I mean, to redo that church, yeah. they, they went above and beyond. So, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, beautiful renovation. So I'm going to give an example of, for example, of how a beautiful renov renovation. So this is, this is so to take it way out of our context, <laughs> we have we have no connection with this church. Hopefully, I don't know, maybe some of you do. But <laughs> <laughs> St. Mary's in Fenimore, Wisconsin. So this is what it looked like when it was originally built, and I realize I don't have when that was built. Okay, so, like, so wonderfully ornate. And then I have an image of when it was renovated, According to modernist principles, that after the Second Vatican was well, now what we know it has nothing to do with the Second Vatican Council, but it was the modernist principles instead. So this is, was the renovation of that space. Yeah, but fortunately they have re-renovated it, just like we did our church, and so now this is what it looks like today. So they've regained some of that that the beauty that had originally. You can see, you know, now they have the, the, uh, the ornamentation um, in the church. So bring it back home again. So let's look at St. Peter's here in Omaha. So this is, you know, St. Peter's, uh, this is 
number, a few years ago, they just finished a remodel now. So maybe, I don't know if you've, any of you have been down there since the remodel. I have not been down there yet. So so this is the best picture I can find. It's a little, little blurry. So this is the remodel of it. So to, uh, to give you a, let's zoom in a little. So this was the sanctuary prior to the remodel. And here's it after. So I'm looking forward to seeing that in person. Um, let's look at so those are those are renovated churches, so we can renovate it according to the to the to principles to bring that beauty back into those places, like also we've strived to do here at St. Columb Kill. Then of course, it's building new churches don't have to be built upon those modernist principles. In fact, from my point of view, I see them as outdated. I mean, it's really you know if you build a church today based upon those principles. You really say, I mean, it's really principles that come from the 1920s to 1940s, and, 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 and uh, so it's like, if you get the proper, so there's there's many new Catholic churches being built that they might look older than the modernist ones because they're using once again those those the correct principles. So here's a new church. This was built in. It was dedicated in 2013. Uh, it's in uh, South Carolina. So there's the outside. You can definitely tell. I mean, much more principles. There's there's more ornamentation on the outside. Uh, here's the inside. You got the the uh, so the altar is very much emphasized with the uh, this, the canopy, the baldacchino over top of it. So this is a parish church. Here's a a chapel at a at Thomas Aquinas College. And here's the inside. So you can, if you know St. Peter's in Rome, you can see that they, they use elements from St. Peter's, the, uh, the uh, Bernini columns. Um, back closer to home again. So uh, if anyway, so this was this was the uh, this was the old uh, Newman Center, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas Church uh, on the UNL campus. Uh, so this was and it's and it was it was a very much a modern style, uh, but. They outgrew it, and so they did a whole campaign to rebuild, uh, to do build a new one, and they're almost completed uh, with their construction project. And so this is a, mo uh, well, a recent Im picture of it. So that's their. Uh, this is like the, uh, the men's dorm that goes along, a men's fraternity that goes along with it, the uh, chapel. You can see, and and you know, it's not simply a going back to old forms. Because it's interesting, you've got some elements of Gothic, you've got the pointed arches, but the the the, uh, the tower really doesn't look like a Gothic tower. It's from, and, and Gothic Gothic churches didn't have a dome, so this dome is octagonal, which is very Carolingian looking. Um, so we can look at the inside too. And yeah, so there's the uh, ambo and then the side chapel, probably for you know, like smaller daily masses where there's not as many students. So beautiful. Um, so and I, I and I don't want to be antagonistic. I'm not trying to be antagonistic with this, but uh, it was just recently announced that um, in Omaha we are also going to be building for the first time a Newman Center. For you and know. and so I actually went to a meeting on Sunday for the archdiocese that was revealing the plans as to what it would look like, and so I'm I'm incredibly excited that there will be a Newman Center on UNO. I think it's absolutely essential. It was very important in my life when I was at Kearney. Um, I am very disappointed as to what it will look like, though. So, uh, so, <laughs> yeah. so, yeah, so let's go back. So, 
so here's that. So this is the, the church oratory. This is the housing building. So if we go back, so this is the chapel. This back here is the housing. That's the, the housing. So I don't know. <laughs> so. Well, in there, and they did explain that there were certain, there were certain, uh, they wanted to, since it's dedicated to John Paul II, uh, which I thought that was awesome. I, I love John Paul II. They tried to bring some elements from him into here, but the problem is, is, which was a good thing, but it really has no reference to the traditional way, the theology of architecture, of how they took those kinds of elements and incorporated them. So, for, for example, just one, uh, one example of it is they wanted to bring in elements of nature in uh, because of John Paul II's love of the outdoors and, and that's where he would meet with with young people when he was a younger priest they'd go on you know kayaking trips and hiking and things like that which you know I think that's you know that's wonderful well the traditional way in which nature was brought into church architecture was to actually take the natural things and build them into the elements of the church structure itself in a style, in a, in, a, in a holistic, abstracted way. So, for example, the pillars represent trees um, uh, in the garden, you know, but they obviously don't look like real trees. They look like they look like uh, redeemed trees. They've been raised to a higher level. Same thing too. You'd have, you know, the the flowers or the leaves in, you know, in, in like, you know, stenciling or or woodwork. You know, those also represented the nature being brought in. So they could, you could use those kinds of principles. But in here. What it seems to be, and I, and I can't tell for certain, it looks like there is a wall covering the back, but when they were describing it, it sounded like the wall was open to the outside, and so you could just look outside through it. If that's the case, what they're applying there is, what we learned from a previous session is, is, is super realism, uh, because they're bringing the fallen creation right into the sacred space. Um, so I am very, I have been praying about it, and I'm very tempted to, I mean, I want to support this as much, and I don't think that the decisions to do this, there's any kind of, I just think it might, I, I hope it's just ignorance, but, because, I mean, I, I've done these presentations because, you know, I had inklings as to these kinds of things, but being able to explain it in a deeper way, you know, I didn't have that until going through all this with you. Yeah. Um, I don't really know everything about people's involvement in it because I wasn't involved and um, it's very recent <laughs> so there are but they're planning on starting it this year um, so yeah I'm a little bit uh, quite disappointed actually <laughs> <laughs> yeah well I guess you know this this is supposed to be like this is the entrance to the chapel and this is supposed to be kind of like a bell tower and so maybe it'll have a cross on it I don't know these are these are the ones I could find online through the architect's website, and um, so I don't know if they may not. You can tell that even from the two of them, there's slight differences in the way the computer rendered it. So I don't know which one is the most recent. Or is the architect you know, I don't really know too much about v VVH. Um, they did work. Uh, they've worked on stuff for our, for Columbkill. Actually, I think no, they they weren't the architects that built Columbkill, but. They've worked in other churches in the Omaha area as well, um, but I, it's just it knowing like some of the other like the architects like Duncan Stroik who worked on some of those other ones that are being built now, or or like for example uh, um, Dennis McNamara, he's another one. Um, it's like he actually Dennis McNamara actually came and and gave a lecture to when they were building the uh, Newman Center in UNL. He came and gave a lecture on the theology of church architecture, uh, which. You can see, you know, influence the way that they built. <laughs> Is he the one who did see Peters? Okay, yeah. So see, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, stemming from this, one could ask, well, is beauty too expensive for us to build? So, and I don't, and I really don't want, I don't want to set up a comparison, but I mean, this was like, it was just here. Like, <laughs> it's like, it's very, it's, it's, it's a current thing. And, and when, so when you go on to their websites and you look and see what it says, so at first glance, it looks like, yeah, there's a huge difference, at least in their campaign goals. So in Lincoln's campaign goals is $25 million, and here in Omaha, our campaign goal is 
10 million. So it looks like there's a huge uh, difference between, uh, between the two projects. But when you actually look at the details as to what is actually the building cost itself, um, there's not quite as big a gap. Um, so this is, this is the real construction costs. So the campaign for, for, for here in Omaha is only designed to raise half the funds, whereas the campaign goal uh, in Lincoln was designed to raise the construction funds plus uh, some other things. So here's the – and these are just things that are posted on their websites. So this, I don't know anything more than just simply what they put. I, and I don't know how – are those – is it fair to compare it like it's just straight like that? Because I don't know what all went into their coming up of the numbers that they have. So, but so take that for for what it's worth. But I think that you know, and and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna put so for example I'm gonna use this Rachel I'm gonna give your example. So let's say you know your experience of being an art student in college in which you are inundated day after day with modernist art philosophy, you know, where would you have wanted to take refuge from that? You know, which, which would have drawn you in and given you, given you solace and peace? <laughs> See, and, and I think that even, even when we spend a little bit of extra money to build into our architecture the Catholic principles, that it's going to, it, it, ultimately it's going to have a, a a greater impact on the, the faith, you know, in, in this case of our young people, of having, you know, even if, you know, they may not know, you know, any of the theology of it, but you don't really have to know the theology to tell and really experience a difference uh, between those two kinds of things. I mean, and not every college student that is hit by modernist ideas, which is, they're not simply in art, they're in, they're in every field that you see, you see different modernist ideas. Um, not, not, not every college student has a, uh, has a personal theologian and philosopher to <laughs> <laughs> go to to break down. <laughs> Some simply need to, a space where they can just be and, and, and be in the presence of something that's truly beautiful. So anyway, I, I, I don't want to be, and I, and I don't want to say that we shouldn't support our Newman Center, I think we, we need to have a Newman Center at UNO, and I think it's a very good thing that's being done. Um, I am a little bit disappointed in what it looks like. Well, I have I have been praying about sending a letter, and yeah, so <laughs> I think I might still do that. So not that I want to be not that I want to be like you know. There's that young priest trying to be all, you know. <laughs> well, he was there at the meeting. I mean, I don't know how much he's involved in that. And so, I I mean, obviously, whatever happens in the diocese when it comes to construction has a kind of approval. But, I, I mean, I do not want to come across as being, like, I support my bishop 100%. But you have your views. Yeah. Well, and the thing – and. And if I if I thought it was simply my views, like my own opinions, then I wouldn't I wouldn't say anything at all. <laughs> but they're they're based upon you know these principles that have come down to us through you know centuries of of church tradition. And if you're trying to uh, reflect the personality, yeah. did they did they choose his letter as artists? They didn't mention that at all. No. No, they mentioned only certain aspects. But yeah, I mean, well, in a short meeting like they had, they obviously couldn't mention everything. But uh, another priest at the meeting, he did bring up the fact is like, because he had also, I, he must have also been in Poland, and he mentioned all the different churches like in Krakow, and you know, the the, ch the churches that I saw when I was over there that John Paul II, his life was influenced by. I mean, they don't look at anything like that, but. Um, yeah. Anyway, I don't want to spend too much time on that, and I I, I don't want to I don't want to leave you know things in a negative light. Okay. <laughs> but I think is that we do have to, in a sense, when we're faced with these kind of things, we do have to be honest about what we're saying through this, you know, and really evaluate. 
can some of these is it really right for us to include some of these principles can they are they are they really expressing you know the truth of our faith so um, I want to give some places that we can visit so in uh, during the year of faith I was encouraged to go on pilgrimage to different churches in our diocese that were like models of uh, you know uh, they were places uh, shrines or, or different uh, and you could, there was actually an indulgence as part of that during the year of faith. So I would encourage, you know, a number of these churches, and I don't give the names here. Um, the majority of them for, have traditional architecture forms, not all of them. Um, but uh, you can find the list on the website and, uh, and uh, links to all those things, including I'll, sh I'll show you the web page here in a little bit, and you'll see all the stuff that's on there that you can use. Other places, like during my time in the seminary, so I went – I was went to the seminary at Conception Abbey, one of my Benedictines. That's really where my love of liturgy and of a lot of this really stems from. Um, it's from the experience of the beauty um, of both the liturgy and the space there at Conception. So you know, sometime go and visit Conception. Just down the road is Clyde Monastery. They have a beautiful little chapel, all covered with mosaics. Uh, you know, I also went to the seminary in St. Louis. So if you've ever been to St. Louis and to the uh, um, the cathedral, the new cathedral, well, it's, old, it's older now, but it's not as old as the old cathedral. Uh, go in there, never forget when Rachel walks in there and sees it for the first time. No, I don't, so, so Rachel, were you, were you, during that time, you were, you were in the midst of your studies, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, can you say, I mean, does that have any effect on your, you know, your resolve to continue in your art, you know, seeing that kind of a space, you know, in a, in a sense that there still exists <laughs> beauty in the world as opposed to some of the stuff that is being forced upon you through your art program. I don't know if you have anything to <laughs> put you on the spot. I was just reflecting. I was just reflecting on that, and I thought, hmm, I wonder. Well, I don't remember. That was before. I don't remember when you, yeah, you first saw it. <laughs> <laughs> so it was after I came back from overseas where I was encouraged. Yeah. So okay. and I, I should have been this long after I came back. <laughs> but yeah, I just remember going in there and I was almost crying because it was so beautiful. Yeah. And that's why, you know, as and many. She just gave it. She just yeah, so. so you know, as, as wonderful as being able to see pictures of the churches like this on here and, and see that, you really, we have to go to them. We have to see them um, in order to really, we got to be in that space. Um, uh, museums to see sacred art, and we really don't have very many museums here in Omaha. Um, the Jaws and Art Museum does have a little bit of sacred art in it, um, not a whole lot. There is a museum attached to the St. Cecilia Cathedral that you can go to um, as well. Um, if you can't make it to the beautiful churches, then I guess you have to, you know, settle for, you know, looking at them online and the virtual tours. Oh, what happened there? Went to the next page. Sorry. Let's go back. There we go. So, everyone recognizes this is a space, right? The Sistine Chapel. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Sistine Chapel. Yes. All right. So this is the this is the website that goes with the with our with the series, and uh, um, so if you go on it, I've got a bunch of sacred art resources on on the. Sacred Art Resources page, and so it starts off with all those local pilgrimage sites that I had just shown you. Um, gives you links to their websites. Um, so they may not all have websites; some of them are small. Also, uh, more local pilgrimage sites. So, so during the Year of Faith, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, all had designated churches. So, if you're in there, those states too, those are places. There's some other resources. Virtual church virtual tours like we just saw the Sistine Chapel. There's several of them that I have found that you can go check out if you want to 
check out Shark Cathedral or the, the Shrine of the National Shrine. Should go, that's a good one to go see too. I've been there. Um, other art resources. You know, some of these are for finding, you know, the saints and symbols that we did last time. Um, some videos to watch about art and architecture. Um, some wonderful ones. So if you want to, if you want to learn more about, especially Roman art, like the Sistine Chapel and stuff like that. Some of these by Elizabeth Lev. She's an art historian in Rome. Um, she her talks are really good, really uh, uh, interesting. Let's see museums and, and uh, so lots of different resources on there that you can check out. Um, fish with some with some books that we can do. Um, so I don't have a copy of this book, but it's a really. Uh, if you want a book of the Gospels, well, two of the Gospels that has a lot of sacred art in its pages. So we had talked about during the Gothic time period that they did a lot of illuminating of texts. So this is an example of basically an illuminated text. It's illuminated with sacred art. Uh, because sometimes our liturgical books in the past, there, since the Second Vatican Council have been rather plain. Hasn't been a lot in them. But there are some resources. This is a wonderful book, um, The Joke's Missal. Um, so like it's a Sunday missile that has all the readings for for Sunday, and uh, it's got beautiful art in it. It's got colored photos explaining the order of mass. The the, uh, the it's got very large print. <laughs> um, so I've got a copy of it. Uh, I have a copy of it over there if you want to check it out. There's also um, the same publisher published one for the extraordinary form of the mass. So, uh, but there it's yeah it's an illuminated missile. So it's it's got the beautiful artwork in it, and it's just. It really shows forth the dignity of what the mass is all about, and it's it, there. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful book. Uh, expect for participating, you could bring it to mass with you, you know. And, um, uh, so uh, this is a this is a wonderful book that I come across, and uh, uh, it's really a way. How do we incorporate this sacred art into our homes? You know, how do we incorporate our faith into the homes in a deeper way? So um, it's called the Little Oratory. It's actually partially written by David Clayton, who might be. He's an artist that I've referenced, and, and partially written by him, and then a, uh, a homeschool. Actually, I'm not sure if she's homeschool. She's a mother of like eight children, and so there's a lot of practical ways of how do I help my children to grow in the faith? How do I help them experience a lot of this beauty of of the church? And so I answer. There's a whole bunch of how to pray the rosary with children and keep the rowdies to them, call them reverent. <laughs> uh, what to do when only one parent takes spiritual life seriously? You know, how to overcome the the idea that you're too busy. So lots of lots of very practical things as part of it. Um, there's a website that comes with it too, in which you can act, you can download um, black and white images of these icons that the that David Clayton has done and use them as coloring pictures for your children. So I've got a copy of the book over there. I just started reading it. It's, it's really neat. Um, so the little oratory, the name comes from a phrase from the catechism. And and in the, in the catechism, there's a spot in there where it talks about having a little oratory or an altar in your home, a place, kind of the sacred place, of, 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 a focal point where you would pray um, uh, in your home. Because you know, not everybody uh, there on the right has room in their home for an entire chapel like I have in my house. You know, so not everybody has a full altar and tabernacle and holy water and <laughs> we we don't we don't, you don't have to it doesn't have to be that kind of an extensive your little oratory in your home doesn't need to be you know doesn't have to have like several chairs and kneelers and you know it could i mean you <laughs> but so statues i just a walk in a walk in sacristy that's my walk in sacristy <laughs> Yeah, so it's yeah, it's wonderful to have you know have this place in your home where you can go and you can pray as a family. And so you know, David Clayton kind of explains it a little bit. Uh, how do you think is praying with visual imagery. And I must get that sense of how I pray and how people relate to that visually. And so what I do is a very traditional thing. I set up an icon corner here. Um, and I have one uh, where I live as well, just a few icons of religious images. Uh, I feel nourished my prayer set up so I can place them. 
uh, and pray. And this is actually very important, I think, for if we're going to re-establish the culture of beauty. Because one of the things that we must all try to uh, develop the habit of is getting used to praying with the whole person. So it means not only visual imagery, but using our voices. Um, if I can, I'll have a little incense burn so that there's a smell there as well. And all my senses are being employed. I consider my posture, do I stand, do I sit? Um, now, especially important as an artist, it means then the whole person is involved in prayer. And so, if God is choosing to inspire me, then I'm opening myself up for body and soul, if you like, to that inspiration. Now, what I have in this icon corner is a very traditional arrangement. Of course, anyone can set it up as they feel best. But um, when I investigated this, I was told it was important to have suffering Christ on the cross, and then the tradition has a picture of Our Lady on the left and the face of Our Lord on the right, and then other images that might change with the seasons, for example. Um, I have a, a St. Benedict's medal, I'm a Benedictine oblate of the monastery in Northern Scotland, Puskin, um, and then also some uh, relics that were given to me when I was confirmed at the Farm Street Church in London. So I'm very fond of those, so I put those there as well. Um, now, the other question that's often asked is how do you pray with icons? I've seen uh, very thick books that have kind of covered the whole subject. And whenever I've asked people, particularly um, Eastern Christians who relate to icons a great deal, what they do, um, and I've observed them praying with icons, is that in fact, it's a lot simpler, again, than many people seem to suggest. What they do is they just turn and look and pray. And they will sing their prayers. And if the icon is well painted and they're looking at it, the dynamic will occur naturally. And so um, icons are made to draw us in and reveal detail. And so they will draw me in. I, I, my, that is my attention, not necessarily physically and then take my attention up to heaven. Um, and so I would just do this naturally. And even at the start of every class that I teach, even not, not a painting class, I'd get the students to stand and face a picture of Christ, and we just sing all our problems. So I'm just going to do that now. So this is one very practical thing we can do. If you don't have a little oratory on an on, 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 uh, icon corner, a, a an, an altar kind of thing, in your home, you can make one. So here's a couple of pictures of some people's own little altar, little oratories in their homes that they put together. Lots of different ways in which it can be done. So, but this is one very practical way in which we can bring beauty into our homes. Um, you know, obviously having beautiful art, maybe other places too, but, you know, especially having that one spot where you go and you pray, because they're not just simply, sacred art is not just simply art that looks nice, but it's art that draws us to God. Um, other resources, those who like to use the Magnificat, you may probably already know, the uh, Magnificat is a, a little monthly missal that has readings and reflections and stuff in it, but every, every, uh, issue in the back has um, an explanation of some piece of sacred art. The cover usually has a piece of sacred art on it too that it gives an explanation for. So you can check that. I have copies over there if you want to look at you know, what that's like as well. We have a number of books in our library here at St. Columkill that have to do with art. One of the most important ones, I think, is The Beauty of the House, which goes through and it has the art and explains the art in our cathedral. Um, uh, so it's a wonderful book. Um, there's a bunch of other books. I've listed them on your, your handout. Um, and you can check them out over there. I'll look at them. And I, you know, after, since the series is done, I'm gonna, I'll put the books back over in the library. And so you can, you know, that way they're available to whoever wants to, um, to use them. A number of them, you know, have the art from the Vatican. You can read about um, the different things. So there's a lot of, a lot of different, uh, uh, resources uh, that we can find uh, to be able to draw us deeper into the beauty, even now, uh, of our Catholic faith. So uh, 
let's let's uh, finish our uh, our uh, our time here with our Lexio Divina finishing our series uh, with some prayer to our Lord using uh, sacred images, and we're we're gonna remember using invoking the Holy Spirit. We read the image by saying, "Well, what is it that we actually see? What elements?" Uh, we meditate. Um, say, "Well, why do we see what we see?" Then we spend time. We pray, speak to God about what we see, and, and then uh, also uh, uh, spend some time contemplating, allowing God to speak back to us before we before we praise. And so I, I kind of wanted to use, uh, you know, this image of the uh, or the Sistine Chapel. There's a lot of stuff going on here, so maybe we'll maybe we'll just focus at maybe the most famous part of it, which is the ceiling. <laughs> I don't know if it's most famous. I mean, I suppose I'm gonna say that it's, there's a lot of famous stuff in it. <laughs> so let's see if I can zoom in. Okay, maybe that'll that'll work. So let's begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our Father, we give you thanks and praise for this time that we've had together through this series. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon this brief time of prayer, that we will allow our hearts and minds to be transformed by the beauty not only of the world you've created, but through the creative works of our fellow brothers and sisters across time. Help us to, to hear what you want to speak to us uh, through this example of, of sacred imagery so then we read the image and uh, so what is it that uh, what do we see <laughs> in this well let's let's stand because that's what we've usually been doing <laughs> Can you see well enough? Uh, is it zoomed in enough? There. So it's probably easiest to start with the center panels. They're depicting certain scenes. What scenes? Is that all you want to say, right? I'll we'll start with the top. Well, you could do it in order, though. Chronological order. That's what you know. Okay. Yeah, so the creation of Adam, very famous painting. Yeah. And God and then and then what else do we see? So here's Adam. This is receiving life from God the Father. Behind God, also in a sense, still in a state of not yet being created, is what's that there? Say, <laughs> well, this is Adam, and then so who would this be over here? Eve. Eve has not yet been created, but he, she is in the mind of God already when he creates Adam. This is the image, too. Remember last time we prayed? Do we pray with uh, Colin to St. Matthew? Going to say Matthew, remember Jesus' hand is made to look like Adam's hand because he is the new Adam. Uh, that's God and God as well. So the creation of uh, Adam. Uh, you go back, these, these are two scenes prior to that. <laughs> prior to the creation of Adam. This is the, uh, the creation of the sun and the moon. God is separating the light. It's, Creating the lights in the sky. Then uh, this middle one is God the Father it's separating the sky and the waters on the earth. So you have at the center, if we continue along the course of the ceiling, uh, to the end of the ceiling, of, is that as far as it goes? Yeah. To the end of the ceiling, then we have. Uh, 
creation of Eve. God's creating Eve. It doesn't go any further. Okay, there we go. Sorry, everybody. It won't go sideways very easily. Okay. We're like right at the top, so that's why it's... Okay, it has to look upside down. Fine. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. So I apologize. Now we have to look at them upside down. That's the only way I can do it. So that was the creation of Eve. And then we have yes, the, uh, the fall of Adam and Eve and just being dispelled from the garden. Then here we have uh, um, the construction of the ark by Noah. And then this is the, uh, the flood. And then down here, this is the, uh, the sin of Adam or Noah's sons after the uh, after the flood. So why why do you think you know looking at that? Let's you know do a little of the meditation part. Why would that be chosen? Do you think for the ceiling of of the the, the chapel of this ceiling? Yeah. <laughs> That's true, yeah. But why is it important for us not to forget it? Because that's where we came from. Yeah, it's our or it's the foundations, right, of the faith it goes all the way back to creation. Um, and, and it is. It's so it tells the story of how you know God creates all things good from the very beginning, and it was through man's own fault that we sinned, turned away. But even after that, you know, there's a consequence for sin in the flood. But God, in a sense, it's almost kind of like a recreation account. But in a sense, uh, God doesn't give up on us simply through that. And even today, even though we, you know, there was still sin after the flood, and we still have sin today, God doesn't give up on us. Um, if we look at some of the other elements, so you know, so those are the, so you've got the high point along there, and then you have other peoples. Along the outside, and, and actually, let's. We'll, this will help us to see it easier. So this is the diagram of of what's there. So we just we just talked about that God divides light and darkness, the creation, the fall, and then the story of Noah. I guess that was the sacrifice that was the creation. Of it. So we see around the outside. We see, uh, um, well, who do we see? <laughs> who are some of these people? Who are, who are some people in here that you recognize? They're individual peoples. You may not know. Prophets, yes. So we have the prophets interspersed along the outside. You've got a lot of the main prophets, some of the minor prophets along the outside. Um, intermixed with probably some people you may not know, the Sibyls, um, if you know your Greek um, uh, history, Greek mythology, Sibyls were basically, were ba were basically pagan prophet, prophetesses, uh, prophets that would, they, they'd had, they had their prophecies that they did, and some of them actually speak of, in a, in a kind of uh, hidden way, of Christ. You can see elements of that being spoken to them. So that so a lot of times the Sibyls were um, involved in, in church art. You actually, uh, like for example, one of the greatest hymns of the church, the Dies Irae, talks about the Sibyls talking, um, having spoke of Christ. So that's why you see the picture here in amongst the prophets in the Old Testament. So basically the reason why is because God is, speaks not only to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. So who else do we see other than the prophets? Also the kings. Yes. So we see. Uh, we see. So these people. So actually, it tells you what they are now. <laughs> 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 so they're the ancestors of Jesus, and they were kings. You know, so so these are so it's this genealogy 
is around the outside. You know? And so it, yeah, it goes. It's like, I didn't look at this ahead of time, so I can't tell you <laughs> if they're in order or anything. I know that Jacob, they, these are definitely these are the uh, immediate predecessors of, of Jesus. So you got Joseph, and Joseph's father was Jacob, and Math and Eliezer. Those were his immediate ones. So I don't know if it's. I'd have to look back and see if it's in a proper order or not. Um, and then finally, we have. Uh, um, well, you've got images of families. So in other words, you know why? Why would they're just they're not specifically meant to represent any particular people, but are just. Like families doing different family things. So what could be the meaning of that? Why would they include just everyday family life? In the midst of that. Got an idea, Dan? No? Okay. <laughs> it looks like you wanted to say something. Well, if you think about it, it's basically showing the story of our family, right? Salvation history. It's got the genealogy of Christ himself. By having these images of families doing ordinary things, it's basically saying your family is included in this. This is, this is your family history. Um, and all the everyday life kinds of things. Then in the corners we have certain uh, stories of salvation. You've got David slaying Goliath, you got Moses raising the serpent in the desert. Um, Hammond, this is the case of uh, uh, Hammond wants to wants to uh, kill all the Jews and Queen Esther is able to prevent that from happening in the book of Esther. Then you got in the book of Judith, Judith, uh, so these are two men heroes. You got two women heroes um, in the opposite corner. So Judith is a uh, 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 a Jewish woman who uh, slays, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but um, was he a Syrian? I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly. But uh, um, she also, because of her, she's able to, to bring about uh, um, salvation to the Jewish people. Um, so a wonderful richness of, of theology here. What? She chops it out. Yeah, she does. <laughs> Don't mess with her. <laughs> She's used as an image of Mary. All right, so not to make you dizzy again. There we go. Looking at it from, from the ground. So we've read, we've looked and saw and just noticed what it is that's there. And then we've reflecting on it, and now we're going to speak to our Lord and pray. So let's let's kneel. If you can't, that's okay. <laughs> Let me turn that down a little bit. So I'll first I'll lead a prayer, and then we'll give a moment for us to speak to our Lord separately. God, our Father, give you thanks and praise for revealing to us this, this great history of your love for us throughout the centuries. In the moment of creation, you had in store such wondrous things, all leading up to the greatest gift of your Son. You have incorporated us into your family. We ask you, especially during this, this time of Lent, to, to help us know that we are connected to that, that we are not alone, that we are that we're not simply trying to, to be good, to become better by ourselves, but your grace continues to work as it has from the very dawn of creation. So I give a moment just to say our own prayers. Having spoken to our Lord, then we... We just want to be quiet and listen for his response.
finish our prayer with some praise. You may have noticed the music in the background. Uh, the music in the background is actually uh, it's by Palestrina. Um, it's Renaissance Polyphony, which would have been produced at the same time as this artwork was going. And uh, it's from his Misa Papa Marcelli, uh, one of his most famous masses. It's the, the Benedictus, which is the second half of the Sanctus, or the Holy, Holy, Holy. And so as part of our praise, Yep, you can go ahead and stand. And uh, and we'll finish by, so this is the Holy, 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 as we know it. And it's the same thing as that music that was just being sung. It comes from Isaiah and Matthew. Um, you may, have, may or may not know that's where it comes from. So what we'll do is uh, we'll kind of, we'll use it a little bit differently from the way that uh, um, it's done. It's, I'll, I'll, I'll begin. And so I'll do the first part, which is the Sanctus, and then we'll say together the Benedictus, which is the second half of it. So the first half, this is the Isaiah part. The second half is the Matthew part. So, holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining uh, in this uh, series. Um, of course, you know if you haven't had a chance to to be here for some of the sessions, you can find all of it uh, online. You can listen to the presentations. You can download the the uh, the notes, and you can find all of those wonderful resources. And you're welcome to take some more looks at some of those resources over there. And thank you for coming again. Thank you for doing. Thank you.